Fatehpur Sikri was created by Akbar, the greatest of the Mughal emperors. His rule marked a major cultural and political renaissance in India, even though he did not know how to read and write. Frozen in time, Fatehpur Sikri is his vision in stone. In 1571, the third Mughal Emperor Akbar decided to build a new capital at Sikri in North India, 33 kilometers from Agra, his former capital. But why did the young Emperor Akbar want to build a new capital city in the first place? The first 14 years of Akbar's reign, from 1556 to 1570, were marked by war. During this period, Akbar had crushed all rebellions and had conquered most parts of North India. survived the palace intrigues during the Regency and had emerged as the undisputed ruler of a vast kingdom. He reinforced his stature by mixing with the Sufis. He made annual pilgrimages full of pomp and colour to the tomb of the Sufi saint Muinuddin Chishti at Ajmer. The Sufis were free-thinking Islamic mystics, noted for their austerity and piety, who rejected official power. Very different from the official ulema or orthodox Muslim priests, who were not only ambitious, but who continually tried to impose a fundamentalist line in state matters. Unlike them, the Sufis were popular among Muslims and Hindus alike. Akbar's association with the Sufis was the seed that grew into Fatehpur Sikri. The story behind Fatehpur Sikri's creation, as popularized by Akbar's official chroniclers, is that Akbar, desperate for a long-awaited son, went one day to Sheikh Salim Chishti, a pious Sufi living in a hut at Sikri. The Sheikh prophesied that Akbar would be blessed with three sons. Soon, Akbar's Rajput queen, Jodabai, gave birth to the first son. This son, 
who later became Emperor Jahangir, was named Salim in homage to the Sheikh. It was in recognition of the Sheikh's prophecy that Akbar decided to build a new capital at Sikri village. When Sheikh Salim Chishti died in 1571, Akbar built a magnificent tomb in his memory, a tomb which is to this day a pilgrimage site. By placing Sheikh Salim Chishti's tomb within the Jama Masjid, Fatehpur Sikri's great congregational mosque, he put both the legal orthodox and the mystic Indian Islam in the same space. By this, he affirmed the legitimate role of the Sufis in Islam, a symbolic and political statement that surely was deliberate. According to Abul Fazl, who was the official chronicler of the emperor and a friend, Akbar discussed theoretical and practical aspects of construction with the artisans, architects and engineers who built Fatehpur Sikri. Organized in families and guilds, they came from two different traditions. Those who came from the Malwa Gujarat Rajasthan area introduced the classical Indian elements of design in Fatehpur Sikri's buildings. The variety of ways in which the classical motif of the pillar was constructed is a clear manifestation of how Akbar's open-minded attitude fostered a new spirit of innovation amongst them. The other group of artisans and architects were from the Jamna Chambal region. They brought the sandstone tradition of the Delhi Sultanate to Fatehpur Sikri. Though their work had been influenced by ruling Islamic patrons, whose ancestors had come from Afghanistan and Central Asia, most of them were descendants of temple and palace builders of the earlier patrons. In consequence, the architecture of this region was already characterized by a fusion of imported forms like domes and arches with the traditional Indian pillars and beams. The way the Jama Masjid's main prayer hall's roof has been covered clearly indicates how Akbar must have encouraged them 
to further develop the synthesis in an innovative manner. Though the main central dome is a conventional central squinch arch dome, the halls on both its sides have a flat ceiling, supported by an elegant system of pillar and beam construction usually used in temples. The spirit of creativity is further demonstrated by the way the unusual ribbed dome in the two other halls are supported by the unique and highly original corbelled penditives. Moreover, the domes are all crowned by a Mahapadma and Kalash finial. This traditional crowning element, often used in temple architecture, is actually a very practical waterproofing device. The open-minded attitude followed by the builders of Fatehpur Sikri is further demonstrated when we look at the roofs. The sloping kaprel or tile roof, which is a distinctive feature of Fatehpur Sikri, is a stone translation of village hut roofs. It shows the ingenuity of the artisans who raised these simple folk elements to the dignity and grandeur of an imperial style. The carved fluting is sometimes covered with blue glazed tiles as in Jodabai's palace. Though glazed tiles had already been used to cover domes and walls during an earlier period, as in the Subs Burj in Delhi, as well as extensively in the architecture of Central Asia, it is in Fatehpur Sikri that they were used to cover an entire roof for the first time. Besides encouraging creativity, Akbar enforced a strong sense of discipline in his craftsmen. Thus, while the brackets are bold and imaginative, they're also exquisitely crafted. The brackets at regular intervals hold up beams that support the stone slabs of the sun shades or chajas, which were used for protection against the sun and rain of a tropical climate. The jalis or stone screens allow one to see outside without being seen. These ingenious devices also allow for the breeze to flow through and by a tunnel-like effect create cool air currents. These intricate stone jalis were designed by persons with mathematical and geometrical abilities, executed by skilled craftsmen, and later fitted as windows or parapets on a predetermined location. This traditional Indian way of working on stone was followed in a spirit of disciplined experimentation at Fatehpur Sikri. This happy yet often elusive blend of freedom and discipline inspired by Akbar's genius was also followed by the unknown architects who designed the palace complex. Its spatial planning was evolved from the indigenous tradition of building around courtyards, a design solution providing respite from the hot, dry climate of the region. These courtyards or enclosed open spaces were also at different levels of privacy. The innermost courtyard is within the harem, popularly known as Jodhabai's palace, while the outermost one is in the Divane Arm, where Emperor Akbar held court for his common subjects.
Jodhavai's palace has a courtyard surrounded by high walls on all four sides. It is said that Jodhavai, Akbar's Rajput Hindu wife and mother of Jahangir, worshipped the Tulsi or the sacred basil growing in this spot in the middle of the courtyard. The residents slept in the courtyard or on the terraces during fine weather in both summer and winter, using the inner rooms for privacy. Apart from the public and the most private courtyards, there is a whole series of more ambiguous multifunctional spaces around the other buildings of the palace complex. These are divided into two main zones separated by a wall. On one side of the wall is the Pachisi court, which could be entered through the Divani arm. Courtiers, artists, nobles, ambassadors or high government officials came here since it was associated with Akbar's many cultural and administrative activities. On the other side of the wall is the area adjoining Jodhabai's palace. This was a very restricted private area. Some historians believe that the so-called Raja Birbal's house is actually the famous mahal e ilahi which was associated with deen e ilahi the new religion started by Akbar. Priests and theologians of the Muslims, Hindus, Zoroastrians and even the Portuguese Jesuits were invited to talk about their versions of spiritual truth here. deen e ilahi was perhaps an attempt to unite common beliefs of all the religions of the time. It is possible that the so-called Miriam's house is Akbar's mother's house. She was known as Maryam Makani, equal in rank to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Attached to the wall separating the two sides is the intriguing many-pillared Panch Mahal. This five-storied structure, the highest in Fatehpur Sikri, was approached from the side next to the harem. Perhaps it was simply Akbar's meditation and leisure place, or even a vantage point from where the royal ladies watched the Pachisi court's activities. One such activity was Chopper, a game similar to the game of Ludo requiring four players, one pair contending against the other. Local guides claim that as in other medieval courts, slave girls were used as counters when Akbar played Chopper, a colorful view rejected by historians. A prominent building here is the Divan -e Khas. This is where Akbar met high officials and important court members.
Some scholars believe this pillar symbolizes an ancient Indian concept, according to which one axis or ekastamba sustains the cosmic order. Was this a representation of a cosmic pillar that sustained Akbar's rule? On the other side of the Pachisi court are the buildings centered around the Anup Talab. The Khwabga or the dream house is supposed to have been Akbar's living quarters. The stone bed within it seems to confirm this. The Khwabga overlooks the Anub Talab, in the center of which the legendary musician Tan Sen performed. The most ornate building in Fatehpur Sikri is generally called the Turkish Sultana's house. But some historians say that this is where the miniature paintings of Akbar's imperial school were created. The transition points between the various spaces in Fatehpur Sikri again reveal a clarity of purpose. In the outermost areas, as in the Agra Gate, there are very definite sharp transitions from one space to another. The Elephant Gate, which is the palace's other main entrance, also has a clearly defined sequence of gates. Another prominent transition is in the innermost sanctum, the gate of Jodhabai's palace. On the other hand, the doors connected to the Divani arm or the punctures in the wall separating the Pachisi court from the more private spaces beyond the wall are much smaller, though they are well defined. In the inner spaces, the transitions are almost imperceptible. Pavilions and verandas around some of the structures in the Pachisi court create subtle demarcations between spaces, adding another dimension to the experience of transition. Frequently, the transition is accentuated by a change in the ground level. But the most astonishing aspect about Fatehpur Sikri 
is the exhilarating sense of freedom one feels while walking around the palace complex. This feeling can be explained by its very original composition. The conventional formal composition is usually based on the alignment of buildings on a central axis linked to rigid bilateral symmetries, like in the Presidential Palace and the Secretariat Complex in New Delhi. A more subtle and delicate system of balancing axes is followed in Fatehpur Sikri. From one spot, the composition often seems to be centered around a single axis. But as we move, we discover a series of other axes. This unusual system is complemented by the different views seen from various rooftops and floors of the buildings. This varied perception of space illustrates the concept of seeing things from many different angles, of evaluating in many different ways. It implies that though everything is related, absolutes are elusive. Akbar's love for free thinking is thus very clearly reflected in this unique design. The harmony found in Fatehpur Sikri, despite the bewildering variety of forms, can be largely ascribed to the nearly exclusive use of sandstone, a locally quarried building material. This not only resulted in a unity of color and material, but also of scale, because at that time, one could only build up to a certain height with the stone. The selection of sandstone reveals Akbar's practical and modest approach. Here was a man who was at the height of his power, an absolute monarch, ruling a vast empire conquered by the sword. He could have made monumental buildings in marble, covered with gold and precious stones as triumphant symbols of his power and wealth. Instead, he chose to create a subtle masterpiece in sandstone. But then, why did Akbar abandon Fatehpur Sikri in 1585? Some historians suggest that the failure of the city's water supply system was the reason behind the transfer of capital. But Akbar's pragmatism and strong will could easily have overcome this difficulty. Actually, in 1585, Afghanistan on the western edge of his empire was being threatened. It is therefore likely that Akbar shifted his capital from Fatehpur Sikri to Lahore in order to defend his territory more efficiently. Akbar never came back to Fatehpur Sikri as continuous wars and revolts during the latter part of his life forced him to live either in camps surrounded by his army or in the fort of Agra till his death in 1605. Ever since, Fatehpur Sikri has remained unoccupied but its mystique has endured over the centuries. Because it is here, between 1571 and 1585, in those 14 years, that Akbar laid the foundation of a new culture, whose ideals continue to inspire us even today. Mm-hmm.